Good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin Butterfield. I'm the director of the Washington Library of Mount Vernon. On behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, I want to welcome you to our 37th library live stream since March 31st. It's been an extraordinary, busy year for us, and we've reached more people than ever before uh, through programs just like this. I'm extraordinarily excited about tonight. We also have uh, the Ford Motor Company to thank for supporting a good number of those programs, including tonight's event. Uh, the Ford Motor Company has been an annual supporter of talks just like this uh, since time out of mind. Uh, we have a couple of upcoming events I would like to tell you about uh, that are coming up, but not immediately around the corner. This is actually our last library live stream uh, for the year, for the calendar year. But on January 7th, uh, Nathaniel Green will be joining us to talk about his book, Man of the People, Political Descent and the Making of the American Presidency, a fascinating book that I've read that looks closely at the emergence of the idea of the presidency over the course of the first several presidencies, including, of course, George Washington's. Following that, on January 19th, Donald Johnson will join us to talk about his new book, Occupied America, British Military Rule and the Experience of Revolution. You can learn more about, sign up for these events, see past events uh, by visiting the Mount Vernon website. Tonight's program is gonna be an exciting one. We have Dr. Jean Baker joining us, uh, a retired uh, professor of history from Goucher College, uh, taught history for more than 30 years, uh, has written 11 books, and we're here to talk about her most recent. Uh, she has fascinating biographies of James Buchanan, of Mary Todd Lincoln, of Margaret Sanger. Uh, tonight, she'll talk to us about her latest book, Building America, The Life of Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Dr. Baker will be joined in conversation, not by me tonight, but by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Susan Schulwer. The Mount Vernon, uh, who's Mount Vernon's Executive Director for Historic Preservation and Collections, and the Robert H. Smith Senior Curator. Hi, Susan. Hi, Kevin. I'm thrilled to hand things off to you and excited to, to watch this interview and learn more about Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Uh, I put it, uh, put everything in your hands. Take care. Have a great evening, everyone. I will see you uh, another time. Susan, thanks so much. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you to all of those uh, who are joining us. Uh, Jean, it's wonderful to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited about this. I think Latrobe is one of those important figures from early America that I haven't really known that much about. And, and perhaps that's true of many of our audience as well. Kevin mentioned several of the previous books you've written um, on a variety of topics, and they don't necessarily seem to lead to um, Latrobe. So I'm always curious about how authors come to find their subjects. How did you get interested in Latrobe? Well, it's been a long road. I live in Baltimore and Latrobe has had an important effect on our cityscape. Uh, he designed our wonderful basilica. He designed a huge merchants exchange. And there are several Latrobe uh, progenitors who have had an impact on Baltimore's history. And as I aged, and I guess that's something that everybody does, I decided that I wanted to stay home. No more of those long, lonely research trips to <laughs> especially Illinois. And uh, the bulk of all of Latrobe's papers is at the what I used to call the Maryland Historical Society, but they changed their name during the pandemic, and they are now the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Mm. Uh, the huge repository of Latrobe materials is in their library, and so here was a local project and a different one. I don't want to go on too long about this, but there's one other aspect of why I uh, decided to do a biography of Benjamin Henry Latrobe. And it has to do with teaching at a liberal arts college where you teach not just your specialties, but you may find yourself, as I did my second year of teaching, uh, in the classroom discussing medieval history. And so you don't get plugged into just one subject. Hmm. Hmm. And when I began this uh, book on, on the trobe, I thought 
how lucky I am to be able to at least try to explain this fantastic life of a man who came to the United States and who really built the major spaces of the early republic. Well, and what a what a wonderful segue uh, to telling us about that fantastic life. So I know you have some great images drawn from Latrobe's work, and I'm I'm sure we're all looking forward to seeing those. Shall we see the first slide? And I'll begin with uh, the one. As a biographer, you have to begin with a birth. This is full neck. England. This is the Moravian community that existed uh, in his lifetime. He was born here. And in the Moravian community, uh, parents were simply not to be a part of their children's life. If children were going to find Jesus, and this is a very Jesus-centric um, kind of religion, uh, they would be raised by surrogates. And so when Benjamin Henry de Troyes was born here in 1764, he grew up in these various buildings in dormitories uh, that were in many ways uh, regimented and controlled by older Moravians. No parents. Parents interfered with this basic connection that Moravian children should have with Jesus. When, when Latrobe was 13, he was chosen as one of the clever boys. And believe me, Latrobe was a clever man and boy all his life. And he was sent to the Moravian pedagogia, as they call them, in what is now Eastern Germany. But for reasons that are always unclear to biographers, although we like to find the keys to our subject, he rebelled against his Moravian background and he was expelled from the Moravian community much to this disgruntlement of his parents who were leading stars in the Moravian church. His father, Benjamin Henry Latrobe, uh, became an important figure in the Moravian church, as was his mother who ran the uh, educational program. But despite their stature, he was nonetheless expelled from the Moravian schools and he ended up in 1783 in London. So Susan, maybe we could see the next slide. Ah, here is the young Moravian who is no longer dressed in the quiet uh, clothes of Moravians and no longer has the demeanor of them. He's become something of a dandy. I spent a lot of time on that hair. I could never <laughs> figure out whether it was a wink. And I finally, finally decided that uh, this was the way that young ladies in London wore their hair. What is also significant about this portrait, and this, by the way, is by a Swedish artist who had come to London to study portraiture. Uh, under John Turner. The, what is also surprising about this portrait is the very interesting series of books and eyeglasses. At this point in his life, um, uh, Benjamin Henry Latrobe was deciding what it was that he wanted to do. And London was a crucible in his uh, entire existence. It's in London that he begins studying architecture under some of the leading lights of the Georgian period. He also studies engineering. Uh, this will be a sidelight that will be extremely important, in my judgment, in the building of America. 
Uh, Latrobe is not only a critical architecture in formulating our spaces, but he also was an engineer who developed roads, surveyed for canals, etc. So maybe we could see uh, uh, the next slide. Now, this is one of the houses that uh, Latrobe built as a designed and built as a young man in London. It's Ashdown. All of his, these English places have to have their special names. In any case, here we have, I think, manifested a, an example of the real genius of Latrobe's ability to design both houses and anything almost that you can think of. We see here the, the clear effort to control the windows, to make them symmetrical. We see here a geometric space that stands as itself as a sculpture. And we also see in that front portico an effort at, in creating an unusual kind of a space. But even here, there are neoclassical influences that will be critical to the development of Benjamin Latrobe's career as an architecture, uh, an architect. There's one other important aspect of his life in London. He marries, and he marries a woman who was older than he, but who nonetheless uh, became, offered him the kind of emotional life that he had lacked in his Moravian upbringing. But sadly, after two children were born to the couple, uh, the third pregnancy was a disaster. The child died, and his beloved wife, Lydia, died. He was also, and this is one of the harbingers of his career, he was also in debt. This will be a constant during Latrobe's whole career. It is not that he spent a lot of money on lavish goods or whatever, or housing or whatever, uh, but it's that he became so involved in his commissions that he would, for example, when as we're still looking at Ashdown, uh, he used the most expensive stone that you could possibly find <laughs> to build that um, interesting portico. And so uh, he ended up in debt and morose over the death of his wife, he decided to emigrate to the United States. And so here we go. I think um, you ready for the next slide? Yeah, yeah. Latrobe was a very talented watercolorist. I believe that he was a kind of Renaissance polymath, as we call them. This is one of his watercolors that uh, he did on board the Eliza, which was the small ship that he took uh, from <clears throat> Gravesend uh, to the United States. It was a really disastrous trip in many ways. It took two weeks to get out of the English Channel. And then in a trip that usually takes two months, it took four months for the Eliza to ever, uh, to, to arrive in the United States. Uh, this is a, a view of, of Dover, and it is one of the early uh, watercolors that suggests that he could have possibly had a career as a successful artist. Let's go on to the next slide. Ah, now all of you know this. And I think that this, uh, Susan, help me with this. 
uh, this is now one of the your collection that you actually yeah. own this watercolor. Could you tell us a little bit about that process, the provenance, oh. or how you got it? Oh, uh, how we got it? Um, it yeah. This uh, this watercolor had been in a, a family collection, one of the Washington family descendants for many years. And um, they elected to sell it several years ago. Um, we researched it. It depicts, as you well know and will likely tell us about, uh, depicts Latrobe's visit to Mount Vernon on a July afternoon in 1796. And it's something La Latrobe writes about in at length in his journal. And we had used the uh, image many times as an illustration. And so uh, we were delighted to be able to purchase it. It went up at auction at, uh, at Sotheby's. And um, I think once word sort of got out that Mount Vernon was interested, um, some other parties that, that might have been interested um, held off, and we we're just thrilled to be able to bring it home. <laughs> As Latrobe's biographer, I looked at this in somewhat of a, a different way. Latrobe arrives in Norfolk in the spring of of 1796. Four months later, he is visiting George Washington at Mount Vernon. To Latrobe, it seemed an indication of the possibilities of the United States. In, in the monarchy of George III, uh, one would never have had such easy access to a powerful player such as the king or the prime minister. And so when Latrobe arrived on horseback at George Washington's estate, it was to him something of a miracle. Of course, he had an entry. He had become friends with Bushrod Washington who was George Washington's nephew and had a letter of introduction. Nonetheless, he was thrilled to have this opportunity to meet a man whom he considered to be a noble creator of the American Republic. He was not so thrilled with the house, Mount Vernon, he wrote in his journal that it was no better than a country English gentleman's home, a man who might have access to 500 pounds a, a year. But nonetheless, this is an outstanding moment in uh, Latrobe's early life in uh, the United States. And as an emigre, uh, it gives him hopes for the future. And if we could go on to the next slide. This is the famous Bank of Pennsylvania. Virginia could not keep Latrobe. Uh, there were not enough uh, commissions. The, the cities were not, the small towns were not large enough uh, for him to be able to use his talents. He did find a commission, and there were always people in the United States who appreciated Latrobe's genius. And one of these was Samuel Fox, who was head of the board of directors of uh, the Bank of Pennsylvania, which was uh, to be located in Philadelphia. And this is an iconic building. It speaks, I think, to something that as Americans, we all know. This is a typical state capital or a county municipal building. It is a neoclassical icon with the, the columns, the vocabulary of the neoclassical uh, uh, architecture. Latrobe always liked low saucer domes, and we see one here. But we also see this elegant portico, which he also 
replicates at the rear of the building. And we see the recessed windows, etc. Latrobe wanted his buildings to be sculptures. And I think it's clear that this is. When we locate it in terms of other buildings in Philadelphia, uh, we see brick and wood. Latrobe always wanted to build with the most permanent material possible. And this building made his reputation. It was something that even came up in novels. People would talk about the famous bank of Pennsylvania uh, by Benjamin Latrobe. Now, if we could have the next slide. Unfortunately, our destructive efforts of, as Americans resulted in the demolition. Here we are in 1872. Uh, this slide gives you some, uh, some indication of how large the bank and how impressive the bank was. It was being demolished for reasons that I have never been clear about, but ultimately it ended up this particular uh, block as a parking lot, something of a sad indication of our taste and what we believe is important. Let's go on to the next slide. Here is the famous Charles Wilson Peale portrait of Latrobe, which was painted while he was living in Philadelphia. Latrobe was a great friend of the Peale family. The Peals ran museums, etc. And this is a portrait that is now in the White House. See the glasses. Latrobe was an architect who couldn't see very well. <laughs> and the glasses were very essential to uh, his career. He's, it seems to me he's looking forward. He's just come to the United States. He's, he's designed and built the famous bank. And he's looking forward to being an American. This idea of being an American became one of the themes that I played with. When I first began, I thought that because uh, Latrobe had been expelled and from school and was a rebel, I thought, well, that's what this guy is. But it turns out he was not a rebel. And I kept looking as I wrote the biography about what is the central theme of his, of his life. And the search went on. Let's see the next slide. As Latrobe struggled to be an American and to play the role of a patriot, and he did everything that one should do. Um, he joined a militia company. Uh, he even wrote a treatise on, on uh, Pocahontas and John Rolfe. He uh, tried to, in many ways, to celebrate George Washington by creating a possible monument for George Washington. On the other hand, there's always a side of a trope in his life in the United States when he's a critic of what is going on. First of all, he hated our politics. And no doubt we can all understand that today. <laughs> He thought that American politics were cramped and local. He talked about political mania. He also hated our social system. He went to dinner parties or in Philadelphia and found that uh, the butcher was there with him. And that offended him no end. There is simply no doubt that we would call the trope a ferocious English snob. But nonetheless, one of the most important of his criticisms of the United States is slavery. This is a famous 
famous watercolor that is used in many textbooks. Uh, it has uh, uh, Latrobe's cynical title, Overseer Doing His Duty. And here we have the uh, overseer standing on the, and the enslaved women working hard. Latrobe was a critic of American slavery, and yet on the other hand, twice in his life, he certainly had men who took care of his horses and his carriage when he could afford one, uh, men who were endangered servants or enslaved. And it is this difficult compromise that I think many Americans undertook. Yes, intellectually, they hate slavery, uh, but in fact, practically, uh, they often use slaves. Hmm. Let's go to the next. In eight, by 1803, uh, Latrobe having lived in uh, Philadelphia during the period from after he left Virginia, <clears throat> he needed a job. His kind of architecture rack, rapidly dried up commissions because mm -hmm. he only designed expensive buildings. None of this carpenter's business of wooden shacks. He appealed to his friend Thomas Jefferson. To me, this is one of the great friendships that perhaps is forgotten in American history. It is that of Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Jefferson, like Samuel Fox, the, the uh, Quaker who was head of the board of the Bank of Pennsylvania, appreciated Latrobe's genius and in, appointed him surveyor of buildings, which gave him control over what we was called then the president's house and of course the U.S. Capitol, the two most important pieces of civic architecture in the early nation. This is the a view of Latrobe's vision of our capital. You will see that it replicates his neoclassicism. There are the low saucer domes. There's the portico. There are the balance symmetry and the idea of a harmonious building where everything fits together. I believe, and of course this is speculation, Latrobe is long dead, that he would have hated the huge dome that so many Americans celebrate over our capital today. In any case, he and Jefferson <clears throat> collaborated and there were times when they both were at odds over how to light, whether there would be uh, lanterns in these uh, turrets or uh, would there be sky skylights. And they had a falling out and so Latrobe produced this watercolor and sent it to Jefferson with hopes uh, that their relationship could be repaired. Let, let's see the next slide. This is a digitized, and it's a digitized image of Latrobe's assembly room, but I think it is very accurate. And it gives you some sense of how inspiring his architecture was. This is a terrific room. However, members of Congress found it to be much too elaborate for a new republic. And they started to complain about how they couldn't hear, especially doughty old John Randolph of Virginia, who said that none of the speeches could be heard. And you can see and tell that uh, in an age without microphones, it would be very hard to hear. Uh, Latrobe responded to this criticism by saying that the speeches weren't very good anyway. <laughs> However, Congress came 
more and more to try uh, to control and cut back on the spending that they gave to Latrobe. And there was a falling out by 1809, and Latrobe was no longer the surveyor of public buildings. I do want to say, although I have no slides of this, that Latrobe also contributed to the president's house. He believed that it was the blandest building possible, that it simply replicated a banal municipal building in Dublin. And so it's to Latrobe that we owe the famous uh, port cachere of the, in the front of the White House. And it's to Latrobe that we owe the idea for the bowed back on the south side of the White House. So let's go to the next slide. Having <clears throat> worked so hard on the Capitol and having anticipated that he might also work on the, on the rotunda, in 1814, the US Capitol was destroyed by an invading British army. The army had found, and, and many of the officers said so in their reports, that there, was, there were only two buildings worth destroying and paying attention to in early federal Washington. And of course, the Capitol was one of them. Uh, the British took all of the wood and the furniture and then fired their famous Congreve rockets into the center of the building. And the, essentially, the building was, in the, at least as far as the interior was concerned, it was, it was mainly destroyed. You will note here that the famous rotunda has not been uh, finished. And Latrobe and Jefferson both hoped that he would be able to uh, work on uh, the creation, the refurbishing of the building and also the creation of the rotunda. He did change his design and uh, we see some of his uh, design on the evening news. If you watch clearly behind the politicians who are being interviewed, you will see what is Brescia, his famous Brescia marble. Latrobe mm -hmm. liked to use native elements and he has discovered this, what was called puddle stone. It's gray and it has flecks of, 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 of purple and red and yellow. It's gorgeous. And he used this in the new version of the assembly room. And I encourage you all, when you're listening to the politicians talking about current events, to look behind them in statutory hall at those gray columns. That is Latrobe's enduring contribution to our civic culture. Having returned to the Capitol, uh, Latrobe had hoped that he might stay there. But again, there really was not enough, there were not enough architectural commissions for him to do so. He had had a short interim time when he had left Washington and he had gone to design a steamboat, if you can imagine. I bring this up just to suggest how broad his career was, how many things he did. He went to Pittsburgh as an agent and employee of Robert Fulton to design a steamboat. He was always looking to some kind of an avenue to create a, a secure financial route for his family. He had married again in Philadelphia and he had 
of three children whom he needed to educate. And the problem with architecture and public architecture is he never knew when he was going to be paid. He also didn't know when he would be fired. And he was in fact fired a second time. And uh, at that point, he moved to Baltimore. Let's see the next slide. Here is a, a portrait, a later day portrait of Latrobe. I love the fact that the eyeglasses that have been uh, such a constant part of his portraits have now, they're now on uh, his face. I love the idea that the curly hair is still somewhat uncontrolled. Now, this is the Rembrandt Peel portrait of Uto. Uh, uh, Rembrandt Peel was Charles Wilson Peel's son. This in a family, uh, just to give a short uh, shout out to the Peel family, uh, Charles Wilson Peel named his son Rembrandt, Titian, Raphael, and this is a Rembrandt view of Latrobe as uh, he moved to Baltimore. Let's go on. Latrobe <clears throat> had to declare bankruptcy in uh, Washington. Uh, he had when he lost his job at the Capitol, he no longer had a salary. He was in debt because his steamboat project had failed in Pittsburgh. And so with some humiliation, Latrobe declared bankruptcy and came to the city of Baltimore in 1816. He had been working on the Basilica for a number of years before that, and so he knew the city. This is a cross-section that I include because it seems to me to characterize the sophistication of Latrobe's presentations to clients. Some said that it was too attractive, that that's not what architects should do. Uh, you shouldn't get clients because you could make pretty pictures. But nonetheless, here is a, a view, a cross section of the Catholic Basilica in Baltimore. It remains this, one of the city's most impressive and most important buildings. What is significant about it is that it is so different from most cathedrals and basilicas. It is light, it is airy. There is a, a double dome that permits light. And Latrobe was always playing around with the idea of light and shadow in an era without constant electricity that gives us light. Uh, this was important illumination of all his buildings. It was also significant because this is high stage uh, neoclassicism. We have the porticos, uh, we have the capitals, we have the columns, and of course we have the massive design uh, that was so important to the Tobes notion of architecture. Uh, the building uh, remains, and I hope that many of your uh, listeners, viewers, whatever we are, uh, will uh, take a visit to Baltimore and uh, investigate what is a great triumph of Benjamin Henry Latrobe's. Let's go on to the... This is another building that uh, Latrobe did in Baltimore. It's a merchant's exchange. I think of it as a, a sort of a mall for merchants hmm. where you include 
there's a bank in here, there's a custom house, there's a post office, there's a reading room. And it, here is this dramatic dome, but it is still a low dome uh, that lighted the whole building. It came in a time in Baltimore's history when the city was going through something of a renaissance after the uh, War of 1812. And again, it uh, suggested to Baltimoreans that their city was important and that through its buildings, it would indicate that to others. Now, this is the last of uh, the slides, but uh, there is a final chapter to Latrobe's life, and it involves his move to New Orleans. Latrobe, again, hoping for some kind of an annuity, some kind of way to have a stable income, moved to New Orleans in 1818. He had previously built a water system in a municipal water system in Philadelphia. And now he had been hired by the New Orleans City Council to create a similar water, municipal water system uh, in New Orleans. And so he worked there for several years until tragically in the summer of 1820 during the many epidemics of that uh, city's yellow fever uh, <clears throat> epidemics. He died of yellow fever, and he is buried in uh, New Orleans. I think maybe because we're in the midst of our own difficulties with what we call a pandemic, it's interesting to note that in the uh, 19th century, yellow fever was the great killer. It was not a pandemic in the sense that internal communities had epidemics because it was carried by mosquitoes. We know how we get our coronavirus. They did not know how they were exposed to this lethal illness that killed about a half of the people who were infected. But interestingly enough, they also used scarves and, and um, pieces of, of cloth, which they would put in camphor uh, to prevent the uh, manifestation of the disease. Things change, but they sometimes stay the same. I want to conclude, and I hope there are some uh, questions uh, from your audience. I, I want to conclude with uh, the contributions that I think that Latrobe made to our civic culture. He designed almost every kind of building that exists, from what he called rational private homes, in which he designed a far more reasonable kind of set up in terms of where the kitchen was, to churches. Remember St. John's Church in Washington, which has recently been in the news. He designed educational institutions. He and Jefferson collaborated on some of the buildings in Jefferson's famous campus at the University of Virginia. He designed barns. He designed almost anything that you can think of. Always behind this was the idea that he was building an America that was permanent and that had important understanding of how significant buildings can be. You know, Winston Churchill once said, I, I think this is when uh, Westminster was being rebuilt, that we 
create buildings, but then they shape us. And to that extent, uh, Benjamin Henry Latrobe had a great influence on the early Republic and on our subsequent lives. Thank you so much. I, I think this has just been been really fascinating, and I've enjoyed so many of your insights on Latrobe as you've gone through the the various moments in his life. And reading your biography of him, it it almost feels like a a, a series of cliffhangers as you go from one city to another, um, one you know, one crisis to the next, what's he going to, what's he going to do next? How is he going to get out of this? And, and yet he doesn't come across as discouraged or curmudgeonly, but he, he seems to always um, be hopeful and looking forward. That's true. Yes. He was, a, <clears throat> excuse me, he was an optimist. He, and that got him in trouble uh, because he was a speculator. He would invest in some of these schemes. For example, the idea of a steam uh, uh, run textile machine. Uh, he invested in all kinds of different projects, including his own steam uh, engine steamboat. <laughs> and some of them were unsuccessful, but he kept going and kept trying. And one of the important emphases in his life was always his family. Uh, Latrobe was a devoted family man. And one of the legacies that he has left my home city is his children, after he died in New Orleans, they returned because they had a sponsor in Baltimore and they lived in Baltimore and that became important businessmen and engineers. And his grandson, Ferdinand, was a seven time mayor of the city of Baltimore. And so I think uh, we as Baltimoreans have a special allegiance to uh, this creative genius. And then since you've brought up his family, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, his wife, um, Mary Elizabeth Hazelhurst, and um, her her role in, in his career. She's fantastic. One of the things that is, is so upsetting when one does a biography of a, a man is that there are no pictures. I could never find images of Mary. Latrobe. Uh, there are all these wonderful portraits that we have of Latrobe, but there uh, is no image. But my view of her, because he he writes uh, really sexualized for that generation, letters to her about, I wish I could hold you and feel your bosom and et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's amazing. But he always compliments her figure. And how even though after six children, she's gotten a little bit stouter, uh, nonetheless, she has the best figure of any of the women in Washington. But Mary uh, Latrobe was willing to go wherever Latrobe went and to make for him the best possible home. Uh, she's there at the end. Uh, she has left the East Coast and traveled with her two young children to New Orleans. She, they have rented a house. Uh, Latrobe is, is special in this way because uh, he never designed all these houses for people and he never had his own house. But nonetheless, they have a small house in uh, New Orleans and Mary and the two children have come down uh, to make for him a proper domestic setting. And I think without her, he would have been miserable. Um, I think I want to open it up if we have any questions from the audience at this point. Uh, let's see. Cynthia asks, going back to the beginning uh, of, of your talk, yeah. 
Um, yeah. And uh, I will just share with the audience yeah. that that first chapter in your book, you've titled Itchy Ears, uh, which is fascinating. But Cynthia asks, interesting about the Moravian connection. How much did that background play a part in his future career? I think, thank you, Cynthia Miller, for that question. I think it played a, a, a fair share, uh, a, a, a lot of importance. First of all, there's the intellectual uh, a contribution that the training in Moravian schools gave him. Uh, it's, it's really a first class education. It's especially strong in math, in geometry, in his talents as a artist, and beyond that, just the mental discipline of a Moravian education. However, and I think I might have a quote here, which I, uh, if I can find it uh, easily, I think that, that um, and I probably won't, so I will just paraphrase it. Ah, here it is. Uh, he always disputed how important the Moravian education was. I think he never forgave his father for the fact that he did not have this emotionally close relationship with his relatives. This is what he wrote to his son, Henry. How, and I'm quoting from a letter, how could a man whom his short stay at a Moravian school had been taught to consider wealth as vanity and to trust to providence for daily food and was thought that to support yourself by your own industry was disgraceful, how could such a man deprived of independent fortune expect to go through the world otherwise than I have done? So I would argue that yes, in terms of intellectual prowess, the Moravian background helped, but in terms of his ability to get along in the world, it hindered him. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really interesting point. And, and um, you know, you see that in, in your book in so many ways as he goes through his life. Uh, it, but I think that that unusual upbringing that he had uh, in his childhood, but yet he goes on to create a, a much more effective, affectionate family in in his own exactly. life. Yeah, um, despite it's his traveling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tammy asks, did Latrobe serve as a mentor to other architects? Did ah, other yes. Share Mm -hmm. Did others um, share his affinity for low domes? <laughs> Not all of them. Um, you can trace Latrobe's influence through various architecture architects uh, down to, to Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, the critical influence here is probably Robert Mills, but he did have when he was living in Philadelphia, he began to take some uh, young men and to mentor them. And sometimes it was successful, sometimes it, it was not. Uh, but in terms of mentoring other architects, one can go uh, through the list to Lewis Sullivan and then down to Frank Lord Wright. And it's a wonderful kind kind of genealogical architectural book, a tree. I, but again, there weren't a lot of architects. So that when one looks at Latrobe's career, one of the things to understand is that he really tried to establish architecture as a profession. And that was hard. It was hard because there was so much competition from carpenters, books, and from artisans who simply uh, uh, built houses without any desire uh, to make them the kind of splendid 
spaces that he wanted to. Now, as far as low domes, I would answer no. Others did not share his affinity for low domes. And that's why we have uh, the capital today. In fact, uh, you probably know this, but on the eve of the Civil War, the great dome of Thomas Walters was, was being um, erected. And Congress wanted to have more. Congressmen liked domes. And they wanted to have domes put over the House of Representatives and over the Senate. So Latrobe was very special in that way. And I don't know whether this is an issue of taste. It's my own view that Latrobe was searching always for a harmonious structure. Mm -hmm. And that's why I suspect that he would have not liked the US Capitol Dome today. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I was so interested that you mentioned Frank Lloyd Wright um, because you you talk briefly in your book about the Walln House in Philadelphia, and and that commission has been recently uh, studied by one of my uh, co colleagues at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And Latrobe was very interested in designing every detail in that house down yes. to the tassels on the upholstery, and very yeah. reminiscent of the kind of control Wright liked to have. Yeah, yeah, and that's new. Uh, architects didn't always go inside. This is what gets Latrobe into the view of Dolly Madison. He and Dolly Madison worked hard on the interior furniture, etc., in the White House when uh, uh, he came back to redo the White House. And we have another question now from Niels, who asks, how did Latrobe change or extend neoclassicism within the founders' embrace of classical ideals? So the architectural mm -hmm. visual counterpart to the political ideals. Uh -huh. um, yes, I'm not sure I'm gonna answer the question the way it's presented. But it's late in the evening, and this is what I'm going to say. <laughs> I The reason that I argue that Latrobe was a founder of the United States, not of its political ideals, uh, but if, of its buildings, is that he connected with them because they too, if one reads the Federalist Papers, one understands this, they too were looking at some ancestor, some precursor. Look, if you have a revolution against the British, you're not going to look to British ideals and political theorists. Uh, you're going to have to find your ideals somewhere else. And the Trove found them, as did Hamilton, Jay, Madison, Jefferson, Washington, found them in the Roman and Greek republics. And so here we have uh, this other path that is being taken. There's politics here, which is being based on classic ideas of non-monarchical regimes. And then there's Latrobe, who is building these buildings that represent those ideals. Now, in terms of how he changed or extended neoclassicism, it's different. Uh, one can look, if you're looking just at the architecture, you can look at the Pantheon and see that uh, Latrobe has changed it. They're, 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 more, they're more columns. The, often the capitals are different. And there's a sense of more having more light. There are many more windows that one finds on uh, Latrobe's building than one would ever find in the the antecedents in Greece and Rome. I think it is it is getting late, and you've given us much to think about. So I think we have time for just a couple more questions, if if you can stick with us that long. Tony asks, in the not so distant past, the Basilica in Baltimore was restored. 
Do you think it was a faithful restoration to its original design? What about <laughs> those onion cupolas? I'm going to pass on the onion cupolas, but look, uh, the trove once said that the the uh, basilica would endure forever unless there was an earthquake. He actually said that, and then there was an earthquake, and there were all kinds of, of cracks. And so uh, the archdiocese decided that a restoration, and it is a restoration to its original design. I think it was is a faithful re restoration. I think it, they did a superb job. And I think if one compares to what had happened, uh, this is what happens to buildings though. They get encroached upon and the basilica uh, in the night before, before the restoration was full of all the g jaws and the decorations that Latrobe hated. He, he, he was very limited in terms of his agreeing ever to decorations. And uh, the colors in the uh, Basilica before it was restored were, were just simply terrible. It was dark, it was whatever. Uh, and I'm going to leave the onion uh, cupolas question well, resolved because I'm not sure anyone is, there's a huge controversy, which is like going down one of Alice in Wonderland's rabbit holes, as far as I'm concerned. Well, we'll, Sorry, go, on Tony. To the, we'll go on to the last question then from Adam, who asks, that's an impressive, oh, this is changing the subject a bit. That's an impressive library behind you. If you were to choose oh. one book other than your own, what would you encourage us to pick up and read? Oh, all right. Here's, here's just to keep in, can you see this? This is a new book on, it's on Latrobe's War Okay. There you go. Can, can you see it? It's all about his watercolors. Oh, wow. So, uh, of course, well, um, it's just the one that's nearest to me. Sorry. <laughs> well, that seems like a good one. And I will certainly look forward to uh, seeing it. It's got Mount Vernon on the cover. So what's not to love? Yeah, oh, great. Um, now, Dr. Baker, you have uh, graciously agreed to uh, write an article for us uh, for our upcoming Mount Vernon magazine on Latrobe's uh, visit to Mount Vernon in 1796. So I think that's something uh, all of our members and followers can look forward to. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your your passion. Uh, you've certainly gotten me fired up to go and look at many of these buildings uh, with different eyes uh, to look for Latrobe's hand in them and uh, his his role in the building of America. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. I want to thank all of our uh, listeners and viewers for joining us. Um, it is your support that makes it possible for Mount Vernon to continue offering these great programs. Um, I hope that you will uh, continue to join us for those and come to see us at Mount Vernon as Opportunity Presents and continue to support Mount Vernon and our, our mission to really um, uh, support American history and learn about American history. So thank you so much for joining us.